I would like to directly go into the sermon uh, for this week as uh, we are following uh, <coughs> the RCL. Uh, the topic that has been prepared or chosen for this week's meditation is the true wine. Jesus said, I am the true wine. I believe all of you heard this statement, am I right? And uh, so, you must be having already in your minds, well, I already know what Praveen is going to say. <laughs> uh, do you know what am I going to say? <laughs> Many a times, I, I used to sit in a crowd uh, and listen. When familiar scriptures come, we start thinking about those verses and we get all of our thoughts that we have in our mind. I, and we think, I don't think he can speak anything beyond this. So I know what he's going to speak. So what happens is when we study and discuss about the familiar things, most of the times we may miss out some small details through which God may want to communicate greater truths to us. So this is my request to the brethren. So as we study various familiar scriptures, so be more careful. Okay? If you are attentive to listen to the preacher for a new sermon or a new topic, that's great. And if you are listening to a familiar one, we should be even more careful. Otherwise, we may just, re just like read over. And I don't know how people say about we may hear over things, I guess. But we may hear, but we may truly not hear what God is trying to communicate to you. I'm not saying these as a correction to the congregation, but it is the same thing in my own life. As I read the scripture, when I come across the familiar scriptures, most of the times, I say, oh, I know this. I used to turn the pages very fast. But surprisingly, especially when I pre start preparing sermons for these uh, uh, familiar scriptures, then my heart goes into repentance and to understand, oh, God is, he, God, the word of God is so profound and uh, he can teach us even with a zot, even with a comma and even with a bullet stop. So the word of God is so powerful and profound. So let us, let us never underestimate it, especially with the familiar scriptures. Having said that, so the title of my message is, I am the true wine. And the focus of my message is, what does it mean for the church to live as the branches of Christ, the wine? What does it mean to the church that we are going to establish? And thanks to Livia for reading uh, the scripture portion in uh, such a beautiful manner. And uh, by her hearing her itself, we could get the picture and the analogy that Jesus was communicating to his disciples very Clearly, in the last week, last week we studied about an analogy or a picture that Jesus portrayed in 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 order to explain himself. What is, can you help me? What is that? What was the last week's message? <laughs> Good shepherd, wonderful. Last week God spoke to us and we meditated on the word. What does it mean to say that God Jesus is the good shepherd? What does it mean to say that we are the we are his sheep and what does it mean to follow him, looking unto him and follow him. That's what we meditated last week. And this week, and uh, we, are, we are coming up with another uh, image which Jesus used uh, for himself. That is, I am the true wine. Okay, I am the true wine. The symbol of vineyard is not... Uh, any unique or something new for the Jewish people, it is very common in the Bible. We can find in uh, Isaiah chapter 5 or 17, and there are at least 10, 12 analogies in the Old Testament, especially in the prophets, where God uses this analogy of wine and branches and the uh, bearing of fruit. Especially in Isaiah chapter 5, verse 1 to 7, which is also called Song of the Vineyard. Here, God says, Israel is his chosen uh, vineyard. We, he, he specially chosen some seeds and planted uh, those seeds. And he loved those vineyards so very much. But unfortunately, the vineyard was not bringing forth the sweet grapes, but was bringing forth the wild grapes. 
so god was so very disappointed with them so he uh, he cut the vineyard off and burnt it off that was an analogy uh, we can get from the bible here the house of israel is the vineyard our uh, the people of judah are the vineyard and the lord of hosts the lord himself is the wine dresser and in zedmiah chapter 2 verse 21 a single verse that explains entire old testament or this analogy of uh, wine and its branches of the vineyard vineyard and the uh, wine dresser or husbandsman uh, that is in zedmiah chapter 2 verse 21 where uh, zedmiah says yet i have planted you a noble vine a seed of high quality how then have you turned before me into degenerate plant of an alien vine this is what god says about the children of israel so we can see that humanity was not able to bring forth the right fruit which it was supposed to bring god has specially chosen the seed god has uh, out of great love with passion he planted the garden but all entire humanity was bringing forth the sour grapes or the wild grapes so that is where god was so disappointed that is the story of entire old testament so what we understand from the entire old testament is god's chosen vineyard which is humans all humans uh, israel has been used as metaphorically since god has chosen them the name has been used in the uh, analogies and parables and the prophecies but god's chosen people are not capable of bringing forth the true grapes the sweet grapes they were supposed to bring forth but all of them were corrupt completely with inside and they are bringing the sour grapes people of god are wine which god tends and uh, and from which god expects good fruit they are expected to yield the proper fruit but they don't and they are destroyed that is old testament story god expects some fruits from his chosen people having said that in this passage john chapter 15 verse 1 to 8 we can find that two times jesus says i am the wine here he is not saying he is the wine dresser but he is saying i am the wine the first time he said was i am the true wine okay so jesus is identifying himself as the true wine doesn't it sound weird doesn't it sound weird jesus is the true wine is there any false wines we have mango trees here can there be any false mango trees huh? he is using the word true wine it is because he wanted to compare himself with something else which which came before that is though all that came before him are false wines the same analogy jesus used as he said about the shepherd i am the good shepherd if he is the good shepherd who ever came before him are the bad shepherds the same thing he explained in john chapter 10 who ever came before me are thieves who ever came before me they are wolves they are not sheep they are wolves in the sheep's clothing who ever came before me they were destroying my to show my herd of sheep so the same analogy comes here jesus is calling himself as the true wine which means all the previous wines are false wines what are those wines the answer is very simple entire humanity jews gentiles all together all are these false wines the analogy which was explained in Isaiah so in Isaiah God was the wine dresser he planted wines which are humans all of us and we brought sour fruit so what God decided no this is not the right thing i am going to plant another seed that is the seed of david and this seed of david is the true wine and who brought forth the sweet grapes the true grapes the right fruit So what is it talking about when Jesus said I am the true wine it is talking about his vicarious life Jesus as a true wine he bore fruit in on behalf of you and me 
you and I are always bringing the wild fruit. Israel failed completely. God says, I'm going to destroy them. But he doesn't do that. What he did, he sent another vine. And now the analogy changed a little bit. Now we are not the vine. Jesus is the vine. And who are we? We are the branches of the vine. So can you see the continuation of the same analogy? And But there are changes through which God is bringing forth a great change into this world. That is the fruit God is expecting from humans is not possible in, from any of us. That is why G God sent his son Jesus on behalf of all of us. He is bearing fruit as a true wine. That is the thing we can understand. It is talking about incarnation. Okay, uh, a, a vine, it is not in the wild, it is not in the uh, jungle, but this vine is something that is planted in the garden that is talking about incarnation. Jesus has been specially brought forth and planted in the human flesh and he brought forth a fruit on behalf of all humanity. So it's about vicarious humanity of Jesus Christ and then Jesus said I am the vine and you are the branches it is a new metaphor he introduced all together and through this he is explaining the relationship between Jesus and us so let's look into this again the scripture said I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser every branch in me that does not bear fruit he takes away Okay, we'll spend a little time here. Okay, this is very quite a disturbing picture to many of us. Oh, we, we believe uh, in the grace of God, right? And here it is written, Jesus is the vine and we are the branches and we have whatever the branch that does not bear fruit, it, here it is written, he takes away. The, immediately we read this word, we think Jesus is going to cut the branches off and throw in the fire. But that is not Jesus is trying to communicate here. The Greek word used here is aero. Oh, my pronunciation is not right, but aero, a -I -R -O, that is the word uh, John used as he, as he was explaining about this taking away. He said, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. If in, your, in your Bibles, when you have time, uh, even when your phones also, you can check. Uh, when you, you open Bible and read these words, there will be a footnote. Footnote, it explains the real word and its meaning. And in the footnote, you will understand, it is lift up. Every branch that does not bear fruit, he is going to lift them up. He is not someone who is going to cut the branches and throw them in the fire directly. Of course, there is a part... Uh, a verse in the same patch passage about throwing into fire. We'll come back to that a uh, little later. But here, in the beginning, we understand one thing very clearly, that whatever the branch that does not bear fruit, he is going to lift them up. So if any vine, you see, you know, my, some of you might have known uh, the plants, and, uh, you know, I, I know in my hometown, we used to have these uh, uh, bitter guard uh, vines, and some other kind of things. Any wine, if it is on the f uh, ground, it won't be able to yield fruit. Because as the wine is going, each and every point where it gets contacted to the ground, there again roots come and the roots will be growing. Have you seen the wines as they're planted? Wherever it contacts the earth, there again roots will be coming. So when, when more and more roots are coming, what happens is, what all the nutrition it is getting, that has been supplied to the roots only to be developed. That is the reason they won't be able to bring forth any fruit. That's why what we do, even tomato plants, right? Have you seen tomato plants? If you leave on the ground, everywhere it contacts, white color, threads will be going inside the earth. So where the entire energy nutrition are going into the earth back, whatever the plant procured. So what we are doing, we are putting, I don't know, supports. We put some sticks or support and we make them to crawl, crawl or climb onto the walls. When they grow, then we find more and more fruit. So what did we do? We lifted the plant up. We lifted the vine up, the branch up. So when the branch is lifted up, it will be able to bring forth 
the fruit that is the word he used and then he said and every branch that bear fruit he prunes pruning means we all know slightly cutting down cutting down certain things uh, here the vine vine pruning is not uh, cutting down the branches actually vine pruning is like photosynthesis we know very well photosynthesis is the <coughs> foundation and the, the base for entire growth of the plants and the fruit we all know if you plant any plant in the shade they won't give fruit why they could not get the sunlight when the when the plants with the leaves when they absorb the sunlight and oxygen or sort of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere they will be able to bring for i mean produce more fruit and more energy okay so prunes what it means is when grape vines are not bring i mean they are bearing fruit what these people do is many a time dust falls on the leaves so dust that disrupts or disturbs the photosynthesis so they clean those leaves so that the plant leaves may do their job the photosynthesis properly and bring forth more fruit that's why the greek word used here is kathairo the kathairo does not mean cutting off pruning pruning cutting off the word kathairo means purging this is the same word used in in term when it is talking about cleaning and all so kathairo means purging cleaning okay so whatever the branch that bears fruit he cleans it so that it may bear more fruit why am i saying uh, pravin you are you are saying you are changing the words and the meanings and you are saying greek words and why are you changing the meanings here it is written take away you are saying it is different prune means cut but you are saying it is not cutting it is uh, cleaning if uh, the very proof is this read the text in its context the next verse itself it says you are already clean because of the word which i have spoken to you if the kathairo is not cleaning how can the second next word make sense next word makes us you are already clean makes it makes sense only if the word prune means kathairo which is cleaning so when you take text in its proper context we'll be able to understand the meaning it is not simply jesus is not simply talking a judgmental word saying i am the vine you are the branches if you are not bearing fruit i am going to chop you off and burn you into burn you in the fire that's not jesus is talking about even when jesus said um uh, Uh, every branch in me that does not bear fruit he takes away that is the greek word this word has been used only in two places one is this the second place it's used was john chapter 1 verse 20, 29 where jesus said i mean john said looking at jesus behold the lamb of god who takes away the sin of the world in the same place in the same analogy john was using this word so if jesus is the vine and we are the branches and if we are not bearing fruit he is going to lift us up and if we are bearing fruit what is he going to do he is going to prune us he is going to clean us so that we may bring forth more fruit this is not like the analogy in the isaiah it is entirely substitution for the you know, song of vineyard in isaiah chapter 5 here jesus he is taking it very seriously to bring forth fruit he is destined he is focused to bring more fruit and even if you read in the same chapter we find three words bearing fruit more fruit much fruit so first he said whatever the branch that does not bear fruit he lifts it lifts it lifts it up so that it may bear fruit and whatever bears fruit he is going to purge and clean so that it may bear more fruit and whatever bears more fruit and he is commanding and saying abide in me so that you may bear much fruit bear more much can you see the comparative degree in the language and how this change is going to take place that's what we are going to uh, study in the next so and again coming back to the same statement i am the vine and you are the branches what this simple word tells 
about the branches. So the focus of my message, as I said, uh, it is uh, what does it mean for the church to live as the branches of Christ the vine? So what does it mean to call that we are the branches of this vine? And it reveals three things. Number one thing is it reveals the image of community or church. We are the branches. We'll explain it anyway. Number two, it reveals the non-hierarchical -hierarchy, model of the church. And number three, it encourages equal focus on all individuals in the church without any discrimination or favoritism. When Jesus said, I am the one, you are the branches, the, in this word, these three points are included. It is talking about the community. It is talking about no hierarchy, equality. And it is talking about equal attention for everything, every branch and everyone. Let's, let's uh, read the first one. It reveals about the image of the community or we, the church. Jesus said, I am the one. You are the branch? No. He didn't say that. I am the vine. You are the branches. That's a plural. He is not talking about individual to you and me. He is talking it to for a congregation, for the group of people. He is talking. Having said that, let me uh, uh, um, uh, let me show you this. Yeah, Jesus is the vine. We are the branches. You know, each individuals we all are part of uh, uh, the vine. And how the branches are in the vine, you know. How, how do the branches look? How do they appear? That's what you can find in the right. Can you tell me from where this, which branch is this? Top right, the grape bunch is there, no? Where, which branch it belongs to? <laughs> or can you tell me which branch, branch this top, any, any one of these belong to? Huh? We cannot... <laughs> We cannot tell, not only for this, even if, if you go home, you, you take any wine, you won't find it. You won't be able to find where this particular branch started, where is it coming from. No, there won't be. All these branches are connected to one single wine, that is Jesus. All the branches that comes in any wine um, is uh, connected to the real wine. Okay, uh, the, la the language is so funny. If it is tree, it is very easy to say trunk is there and then branches are there. But when it comes to wine, both are wine only. <laughs> so it is a little difficult to communicate. However, so if we cannot find where one branch is connected properly. We cannot uh, distinguish, in other words. That's what I'm trying to say. You cannot distinguish one particular branch here. All branches are interconnected. In a wine, branches are almost completely indistinguishable from one another. Where one branch stops, another branch starts. Where one branch stops, another branch starts. Let me look at our own lives. How did you come to the church? How did you come to the church? Church belongs to Christ. How did you come here? You know, we all have come by, by somebody we know. They introduced the church to us, right? Do we know them before? No. Are those people are still there? Some may be there, some may not be there. Some will not be there. We all know that. Through us, some other people have come. And how did those people who brought us into the church came? They came through someone else. All of us, we have come because of a chain reaction and because of one single vine, the branches which came out of that vine are 12 branches, <laughs> the 12 disciples of Jesus Christ. All of us are somewhere or other descendants of these 12 disciples from, from one, one person to another person. I, I can tell, I know the story, how I came to this church. It has a huge story. It started, I can say it started in 2008. From 2008, I have the roots that led me to this church. All of us must be having similar story. Am I right? How you, how you came to the church. So what happens is every branch here, it is connected to the vine through another branch. 
and where one branch ended, another branch started. That's what we are talking about. The Mr. Zechariah leadership is over from here, and another leadership is taking. So where a branch is stopping, another branch is taking it over. So it's similarly, all of us are here because of other persons. None of us are here by ourselves. Do you agree with me? Okay. All of us are here because of God's work, because of someone else. So, in the church, each and every person is so very important and each and every person, so no persons can be distinguished. We cannot separate them. We cannot see them separately. All of us are somewhere or other completely connected. And all the vines, they run together as they grow out of the central vine. All these vines, they grow together. Okay, and there are no uh, independently standing individuals in the church community. That's what this is talking about. All are connected. We may be sitting next to each other. We may not be knowing anything happening that in our brother's family or what they are going through. We may not be communicating to them uh, for the entire week, sometimes entire month, sometimes years we may take to communicate, but we don't. We we may not know how, whether we are con connected to them or not. Many a times, emotionally also, we may not even feel. But let me tell you, in the Church of Christ Jesus, there are no independent individuals. All are connected with one another. We cannot separate them. We cannot distinguish them. We have to look at them as one body, one wine. And there are no independently standing individuals in the church. But branches who encycle one another completely. That's what we can see in the wine and in the church. We are connected to each other and encircled around each other. That is the reality of the church. And we should be able to understand. This is the picture of the church. Jesus is trying to communicate to us. The wine metaphor challenges the Western individualism and emphasizing social connection and uh, shared responsibility at, at its core. We know the world, uh, you know, I wonder, my parents, they come here every time they come. Uh, I'm, I'm truly telling you, I don't know my neighbors, what their names and all. I don't know what they do and all. I don't know. My father has more friends in my locality than I do. My mother, they know. They know people around us. I don't know. You know, we all are growing towards a life like this, a Western, a Western life, like this, where we don't have connection with our, with people around us. Okay, and this wine analogy it challenges such life. And the most unfortunate thing, you know what? I don't know my neighbors, most of my neighbors are not, at least my brother, Christians are not, uh, they are intrigued, many of them are anti-Christian, you know, they are against Christian faith. Uh, unfortunate thing is, it is happening within the church. You know, we are calling it mega churches, the most successful churches. I don't want to take the name, it's happening even in small churches also, but that easy example that's why I'm taking it you know we say successful church there thousand people are coming 10,000 people are coming 15,000 people are coming and when the service is happening we don't know anyone even the person who is sitting next to us we don't even know that is the reality that is happening and people there are there are people who say oh I'm going to church for God not for people oh excuse me that is not right if you come with such opinion, with such attitude, that is not Christian at all. Probably you don't even know God. Why am I speaking such judgmental language? I'll tell you. <laughs> Later I'll show you some verses as well. Okay. If we say that we are coming to church for my, me and God, not for anything else, not for anybody. Oh, no, not at all. In Christian church, everybody are interconnected, interconnected with each other. We cannot escape from one another. We, God wants us to be together and together only we exist and together only we thrive, together only we flourish and we bear fruit. That is what when Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches, mean. 
the vine and the branches metaphor exhorts the community to steadfastness in its relationship to jesus a steadfastness that is measured by the community's fruit this tells us to be strong together in christ and and the greatness of this community is known only by its fruits to live as branches of the vine is to belong to this organized community and the unity where we all together share one faith and one life and one goal that is what we are doing here it can be clergy or it can be laity it can be pastor or it can be a member we are all together church cannot function if only pastors are working if church cannot function if only leaders are working church cannot function if only ladies are working or only men are working only children are working or only youth are working or elders are working all of us have to come together then only church would be able to bring forth its fruit and that is the purpose that god had for the church the individual branch is subsumed into the communal work of bringing fruit so individual branch <laughs> is already part of this group of vines group of branches there only it has its goal to bear fruit many a times we read this word jesus said i am the vine you are the branches and we consider individually ourselves okay i am connected to jesus <coughs> it is about me and jesus if my works are good if i am religious enough if i am di disciplined enough i am bearing the fruit oh no that is not what jesus is communicating here it is not about individuals it's about church together bearing the fruit or not and church is not a community built around individual accomplishment choices or rights but around the corporate accountability to the abiding presence of Jesus Christ as a church what is our fruit what is our growth it's not by the individual uh, accomplishment we cannot say the greatness of the church because couple of ias officers are attending we cannot say church is so great because all our members are educated you know there is a lot of churches who feel proud about it churches feel so great because all the members are rich or some people feel the spiritual thing all the members are from uh, non christian background so we are the most evangelical church here we feel proud no that is not it is not by any of the accomplishments of individuals church is not uh, uh, to be it's, it's not a community built around the greatness of people's uh, choice the, the choices they made from our church all doc i went to a church in karnul they were telling me you know what in our church there are at least 80 doctors and they are so proud of it it's good it's a good thing that educated community are there but that is not something that qualifies a church what qualifies the church is the fruit that the church is bringing forth and what is that fruit that we should be able to understand okay we'll we'll go to the fruit little later and uh, very fast i'll co complete my two other points it reveals that no non hierarchical model of the church if you look at this branch there is not even one can you tell which branch is great here can you tell which branch is great no all branches are equal there is no great uh, so uh, you know great person ranks 1 2 3 and all like in the army we don't have we all are together and that is the same example even our leader has set forth you know a 60 years old man washing washroom that's an example he set forth there is no big and small all are equal and fruitlessness is the only differentiation among the branches and the discernment of this fruitlessness uh, uh, fruitfulness is completely in the hands of god only as it uh, said the members can be seen differently only by the fruit they are bringing forth all the branches thus are the same before god distinguishable only by their fruit all are equal there is no difference there is only one standard in the community that measures the fruitfulness and that is the uh, that is to love as jesus loved us 
If there are any standards in the, within the church to consider somebody who is connected to the vine, that is this simple standard. Whether we are loving other person or not. Nothing else. It is not by how much donation you are giving. Okay? It is not by how much work you are doing in the church. It is not by how greatly you can preach or you know the verses you are teaching here, doing ministry here, that and these. No. It is by how much you are able to love your brother as Jesus loved us. That is the only distinguishing factor. That is the only qualifying factor for us to be the branch. Whether great, uh, you know, whether great or small, ordained or lay person, young or old, male or female, all are equally accountable to the one single standard that is loving the other members. And It is the gardener's role to prune and shape and the wine to oh, and enhance the wine, wine's fruitfulness. You know, as I said, it is about how much we are loving our brother. And let me tell you, my brethren, this is not something we'll be able to do by ourselves. It is very difficult. It is only the wine dresser who could do that. He is the only one who can lift us. He is the only one who can lift the barren branches to bear fruit. He is the only one who can clean the fruit bearing branch to bear more fruit. And he is the only person in whom we will be embraced and abide so that we may bear much fruit. And next thing is the metaphor doesn't give importance to any single person and it give, doesn't give attention or a uh, special focus on anyone. The visuals of this image we can see, uh, the branches and these things, it can clearly tell that there is no special uh, attention given to any of these branches. All the branches are given equal attention. Okay? And in the church there are no partialities. There, are, there is nobody showing special attention to one person and to the other person. But as humans, sometimes we may fail. Or we may choose some, somebody or we may like. But at the same, but the reality is in the church of Christ, there is no possibility for that. And by the Spirit of God, we all overcome. We all together, we overcome. As a church, you know, there's a sometimes, sometimes we may think, oh, pastor is giving more attention to them, not to us. And those are the more important people. Oh, now there is form, a leadership team is formed, for our pastor focuses more on the leadership team. And we are the bank, back a few people. So, you know, a pastor's attention is only on them. No. As humans, sometimes we may fail in presenting but in reality, in the Church of Christ, all are equal. There is no special focus for anyone. All are given equal importance and equal opportunities. All are treated equally. And uh, uh, nobody is treated different, distinctly. And uh, as a pastor, as a me member of leadership team, we would like to confess it to you. Uh, you know, even I take on behalf of Pastor Dan also, I would like to tell these words to the congregation here. We consider all of you are equal. We don't give, show any special preference to anyone. And uh, we respect each and every person equally, starting from small child to the eldest person. All of you are special to us. And it, we consider it as an honor to serve you. I would like you church to be aware of it and believe it then only as a congregation we can be stronger together and can grow together and that's how you all promise me that you will help me to grow as a pastor that's how you all are also going to uh, help uh, as uh, pastors you know in this john's analogy there are no distinctions and all are given equal importance and another example we can see similar example that is paul apostle paul he gives an analogy of the body Church is the body of Christ, and each one of each one one of each one of us are unique uh, organs. He gives, but at the end, what he says, all these organs work, work together for only one thing—that is edification of the <laughs> church. 
So, in the distinction which is used by Apostle Paul, it is for the edification of the church. Here, equality is chosen is also for the edification of the church. According to this metaphor, it shows all are equal. The mark of the fruitful community is its fruit. And now I'm coming to the last point. The mark of the fruitful community is its fruit. And you know what is that fruit? Love. Love is the fruit. Jesus said here, I am the vine, you are the branches. And whoever does not bear fruit, oh, sorry, abide in me, then you will be able to bear much fruit. And whoever does not abide in me will be cut off like a branch. Right? Here the fruit is, Jesus is not asking individual members only to bear fruit. He is asking, the church will grow and church will bear much fruit when it is together. And the fruit is love. What is the fruit of the spirit? Fruit of the spirit is love. Is it possible for one person to have this fruit? Can one person have love? No. Love cannot exist with one person. There should be more than one person for love to exist. Peace. Can peace exist with one person? No. There should be more than one person for peace to exist. Self-control. Is it with only one person? No, it, these all are related. Joy, everything, all the nine fruit you read in the book of Galatians, the fruit of the spirit, uh, the primary one fruit love in nine folds. Okay, but all this fruit is only one fruit that is love and this love is a community fruit. It is not a fruit of a single person. That is the reason I am telling you when Jesus said, I am the one, you are the branches and you should bear fruit. He is not talking about your personal, individual, spiritual discipline. You may be disciplined. It is good. It is important. I am not against it. It is very important for all of us. But he is talking to a church for as a community together. It is talking the fruit is about love and which one person cannot bear fruit. My brethren, let me tell you, we as GCI India here, or G people here, the, ch the Church of Christ, Church of Jesus Christ here, all together we are 40 or 50 people here. We cannot bear fruit by ourselves. If you stay single to our individually, we live, we cannot bear fruit. When we all come together and work together, then only we will be able to bear the fruit because the very nature of this fruit is community community based the very nature of this fruit is relational that's why we all have to work together the fruit is a community fruit not an individual fruit and branches are called to bear this fruit fruit and you know what an interesting word here it is written bear fruit not produce fruit bear fruit not produce fruit you know what is producing fruit Producing is something doing by ourselves. We do something by ourselves and bring forth the product. Bearing is somebody does through us. That's why we call fruit of the spirit. Whose fruit? Our fruit? No. Fruit of the spirit is <coughs> the fruit which was brought forth by the spirit. Here Jesus said bear, bear fruit. Not produce fruit. Because Jesus knows it is he who is going to bring the fruit out of us. But we should be abide, abiding to Jesus. We should be connected to Jesus. Then only we will be able to bring forth that fruit. If you are not abiding in Jesus, we won't be able to bring forth the fruit. It's a fruit. It, let, let me tell you. Let me take the burden off your shoulders. It is not the fruit you and me by, are going to produce. It is Jesus is going to produce this fruit. And when we are together as a body of Christ and abide in him as the branches of the vine, all together, then the fruit is going to come forth. And that is a relational fruit. Then, then only it will happen. And uh, <coughs> fruit of the spirit is also fruit that is given by Jesus. And last point I will come and I would like to close. And in this passage it is written, abide in me, abide in me, abide in me. I always struggle with this. What does it mean to abide in Jesus? How can I abide in Jesus? I am reading my Bible in the morning. I am doing my personal prayers. I am coming to the church. I am giving the donation in the church or outside I am helping the people. How can I abide in Christ? 
Anybody had this question? I suffered. You know, wow, what does it mean to abide in Christ? Is it about the spiritual disciplines? If we think we are mistaken. Abiding in Christ doesn't mean spiritual disciplines. Of course, spiritual disciplines are important. Please don't misunderstand. I am not saying to neglect spiritual disciplines. Okay? What does it mean to say abide in Christ? The answer is very simple. Abiding in Christ is not just about doing spiritual disciplines personally. The answer we can find is from the scripture 1 John chapter 4 verse 20. Where it says, if someone says I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he, does not, for he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? What he meant to say was simple. If someone says, I love God, but I don't love my neighbor or brother, that means he is a liar. Means, if you abide with God, it will be seen when you are loving your brother. If you are not loving your brother, that means you don't know God. Abiding in is next thing. You don't even know God. So how can we abide in Jesus? The answer is very simple. We abide in Jesus by completely coming, giving ourselves vulnerable to our brethren in love. Abiding in Jesus is not about praying 10 hours. Abiding in Jesus is completely coming towards our brethren, family members, church members, any other. We know they may sometimes they may misuse us, abuse us, they may hurt us, but out of love, vulnerable, we present our vulnerability and come before the other person and to love the other person, that is the way we abide. When the branches are coming together, they are more closer to the vine. When, you know, in marriage relationships, they will tell triangular relationship, you should be, you are one angle, your wife is another angle, the third angle should be God. How these two can come together? When they go towards God, they can come together. So when these two are coming together, uh, in a contrast, when these two are coming together, they are coming closer to God. That means how can we come close to God? When we come close to our brother. In simple words. How can we abide in Jesus? By loving our brethren. And abiding in Jesus in this, it's a choice. Because it is you or me who choose whether we want to come close to our brother or not. Otherwise, <laughs> I was just wondering, the branch is already in the vine. How can we say, again abide? It's crazy. Right? If it is not there in the vine, it's already been somewhere trash. But he said, you are already in the vine, but abide, he is asking. How is it possible? It is possible only in this manner. When we come close to our brethren, we are coming close to God. So, after this long sermon, I know your minds are hot now. It must seem, I mean, smoke must be coming. And uh, yeah, I'm so sorry I took more time. Anyway, in conclusion, what I would like to tell you is this. When Jesus said, I am the true wine. He said, Jesus is the true wine who came to bear the fruit on our behalf. Now, God is not expecting you to bring more fruit or any fruit. It is Jesus who stood, uh, stood on our behalf vicariously. He is bringing forth the fruit. How is he going to bring forth the fruit? As we said, we have a wine dresser. If any branch that is not bearing fruit, he is going to lift, 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 stuff, lift it up. And if any branch is bearing just fruit, he is going to clean it, purge it, so that it may make it may more it may bear more fruit. And and he challenges us and commands us to abide in him. And as branches together we abide in him, we bring forth much fruit. Jesus is the one who is going to produce that fruit. And he makes the branches that do not bear fruit to bear fruit, more fruit to much fruit. And the branches can grow in the vine only with other branches only. If other branches are not there, these branches cannot grow. As together, branches together. Coming together only, we'll be able to abide in Jesus. And we are going to bring forth the fruit. May God bless you.